In late November 2018, a special reunion took place at Wanderers, where cricketers who played during our nation's tumultuous past came together from across South Africa to celebrate, reminisce and recount priceless memories collected during their exuberant youth when they were actively involved with the gentleman's game. Memories that have endured for decades. The group consisted of players that were active from the 1940s through to the late 90s before the end of enforced racial separation in South African cricket. The guests were thus a veritable living encyclopedia of cricket in non-white communities in South African cricket history. But before we delve into the emotional and vivid collective memories, we found out about how the idea of the reunion came about. I was in Cape Town and I had supper with Iqbal Khan and his family. It was at his birthday and we, you know, as usual, we talk of cricket. And uh, we say, I said to him, you know what, we're forgetting our old players, guys that have really played well, guys, guys that have taught us, taught us the game. And we should really try and do something for them. And, uh, you know, he was very keen. He said to me, why don't you kick on with this? And uh, it just started from there. Well, the response was overwhelming. Um, it was a short time in which this was arranged. And without most of these guys, I must tell you that 70% of those almost 200 people that attended were over the, over the age of 70. One of the things that they wanted to do was acknowledge Abdul Bamji and uh, to get hold of them to try and uh, uh, leverage uh, some way in which to get hold of them was proved quite difficult. But in the main, most of them were eventually contacted and the response, as you, if, you're, if you're asking, was overwhelming. Guests embraced each other warmly, with some not having seen each other for decades. The reunion was charged with emotion and nostalgia, and the passionate recounting of events that happened more than 40 years ago, as if they happened yesterday, was inspiring. Phenomenal. It's, it's, a, it's a gathering that's long overdue. I mean, the age, the oldest guy is in his 80s, and the youngest guys are in their 40s, and they've all got one thing running in their blood, and that's crickets in our soul. This is a wonderful, wonderful occasion. I think somebody said to me that they, when they go to weddings, people are not so happy. <laughs> it's a wonderful occasion to be at. Absolutely, absolutely. It's fantastic to get the guys together and uh, you renew old friendships and guys you played with and so on. So it's, it's uh, actually a very excellent idea. I walked in here not expecting the kind of energy and numbers and I think it's very special to have pulled together how many people, more than a hundred old players, but really carefully selected and invited by their own peers of their time, you know, through the committee and Kulam Raja and the other people. This is a dream come true. What is the purpose of this? It's, for me, it's a way of saying thank you to those people who I started playing cricket with. Some of them are gone already, and those that are alive, I'd like to say, hey, listen, we might have played cricket 20 years ago, but the friendship, the bond is still there. As the mature audience took their seats and the master of ceremonies took the stage, it was time to share in all the laughs and legendary stories that were doing the rounds. We sat down with a few of the veterans as they shared their unforgettable love affairs and special memories, some going back as far as the 1940s and 50s of the game. It was difficult conditions, they, they, they worked on the, during you know, the day to day. So when it came weekends, you didn't have facilities, you didn't have proper net facilities and that. So we could just do wherever. It was street cricket, it was cricket on the grounds. We grew up in places where the, the, the community was very close-knitted. And remember cricket, the, the love of cricket was so much. So if you excelled in your community as a cricketer, uh, you know, people sort of gave you the, uh, let's say, the, the, the support. There was great support amongst families, amongst friends. So there was lots of keenness, lots of enthusiasm, and people traveled long distances as well to play the games. Unlike today, today, you know, things are much easier. But those were the conditions that uh, black cricket is played under. So although the facilities weren't there, the love was more important. And people had their own heroes in, their, in our own cricketing uh, you know, circles. 
social engineering was a cornerstone of apartheid rule in South Africa, and one of the most effective measures of implementing this was the Group Areas Act, which created racial segregation along geographic lines. This obviously affected sport, and non-white cricketers thus faced many difficulties in trying to pursue careers in the game. I think in those days, I think in, in, before unification, the biggest challenges was, of course, uh, facilities, uh, uh, financial support, no sponsors, etc. So it was very difficult. And of course, you know, the game was still played on, under racial lines, uh, Indians, coloreds, Malays, Bantus, those type of things, which we finally got rid of uh, in the 1960s by forming the South African Cricket Board of Control. And we all amalgamated together but it was, a con I think, a continuous challenge for black cricketers. And I'm glad to say that today that we have many, many black cricketers who play cricket on merit and play for their country. During apartheid in South Africa, non-white athletes from all codes of sport were excluded from national team selection. This did not deter passionate sportsmen and women from competing. However, they were restricted to federations that had to be established and restricted to racial groupings. Cricket had seven separate federations and unions. For those non-white players that exhibited exceptional talent, there was no option but to travel abroad in search of international recognition of their abilities. We had Dick Abed, who played in Holland and was an exceptional, uh, one of the best cricketers going there in Lancashire, in the, in the league in England. And then you had Oliveira, Basil de Oliveira. He also went from here and eventually ended up playing for England. We had Owen Williams as well. So because things were limited, our cricketers had to look for other avenues. And then some of them had to go, most of them, I think, had to go to England to play the cricket. Well, there was Abdul Bamji, there was uh, there was question of T.P. Barnes, uh, there was uh, Abu Manak, Soli Chotia. In other countries, in other provinces, you have, of course, Basil de Oliveira, Tiny Abed, Lobo Abed. Uh, there was Eric Peterson, Ben Malamba who played for South Africa, those were, those were names in, uh, in every cricket household and we knew them and they were our stars in those particular days. It was only in the 50s and so on when, I'll tell you about how Basil Dolivira went overseas and made it. But in those days, you were in a local community celebrated by your own people but an unknown outside. And I tell you, we produced some great cricketers. One person I must rem uh, remind you of, is a chap, Eric Majola. He could have played for South Africa in the rugby and in cricket. He's from Eastern Cape. He's Gerald Majola's late dad. And you could see we had a talent. We had a talent. If you read Andre Woodendahl's book about black cricket, you'll see we had a lot of cricketers, but obviously we didn't get the opportunities. But uh, having said that, I wasn't very uh, disturbed about it or you know, felt bad about it. It is just that I felt let me go and do something and show the outside world that we can produce cricketers. And today when you see uh, the Rabadas and the Bavumas, then you feel proud that at least it's shown to the world that we were denied playing cricket those days. Oh, got him! Beauty! What a delivery that is! That's come back superbly and the Rabadas now popped up. They needed that. Really good stuff from KG. One black cricketer that rose to prominence, perhaps as one of the most famous in the history of the sport, was Basil de Oliveira. Born and raised in a current community in Cape Town, Basil made his way to England to play competitive cricket in their local leagues. His prodigious talent on the field saw him progress all the way to the England national team, where he continued to deliver outstanding performances throughout his career. Basil de Oliveira got the opportunity to play club cricket in England, eventually qualified to play for them. And at, a, at an age of maybe 32 or 34, he actually made it for England and played 42 test matches and, uh, you know, scored a dozen centuries and uh, took a number of wickets as well. In fact, he made the England team as an all-rounder. So that was the catalyst to uh, why these guys then had to venture to look to play uh, elsewhere, greener pastures. And of course, he was fortunate enough to represent another country and a number of others were able to represent England because uh, they're of their parental background, they obviously carried British passports, so they were able to play. It was in August 1968 when Basil de Oliveira scored 158 runs at the Oval against Australia, which was a standout innings that won the Test match and drew the series. It was an innings that cemented his legendary status in cricket history. 
But what followed took his popularity beyond the ropes on the edge of the cricket field as it played a vital role in raising global awareness of the plight of non-white South Africans. After his 158, England was due to play South Africa in South Africa that winter. Unfortunately for Basil, he was not selected as part of the English squad for the tour, and due to the apartheid system, it became obvious that the reason for his exclusion from the English team was based on the law that the South African national team only faced white opposition. Since de Oliveira was a Cape Townian colored, the apartheid government was heavily suspected to have had a hand in him being dropped. What did happen was it was such a furore, the whole Dolly affair, that uh, when the tour of England was cancelled to South Africa, when John Foster had said they will not allow him to uh, a colored to come and play on South African shores, and that it was the uh, the MCC team picked by uh, the anti-apartheid movement. So what happened then was that was the final nail in the coffin. Well, once the Dollar Vera affair took place, and South Africa you know, didn't welcome him, and England dropped him, and eventually the world realized it was crazy. So they, South Africa, were isolated. And that played the major part, you know, in, in the abolishment of South Africa cricket who, can't, who couldn't go and play against whether it's Australia or England. So sports definitely played the part in, you know, in abolishing the party. There's no denying the division that the oppressive laws of the country created for more than four decades that apartheid was in existence. Many people from all walks of life and race groups stood together to fight against these laws, and one of the most effective means of shining light and gaining exposure for this plight was through sport. After 1976, um, there was an attempt to play normal cricket in 1976-77 season, where people said, we'll play together if you give us the chance. But that was the year of the Soweto uprisings, which changed the whole balance of power in South Africa. And people realized that it wasn't now about playing cricket together. It was about totally changing society in an uncompromising way, demanding full citizenship for every South African. So you couldn't play and uh, live in an abnormal apartheid society during the week and then pretend you're playing normal cricket over the weekend and go back to your separate areas. Looking at the powerhouse the protests are today, we have surely come a long way as a nation. Credit must be given to the cricketers and indeed other selfless athletes for their vision of how the power of sport could be used in changing the hearts and minds of an oppressive system, thus opening up a world of opportunities for all South Africans. But if you just look at the administrators and what it meant for them to be uh, and to see their fellow sportsmen being isolated from world sport. There was a realization that it's not going to happen until there's democracy in the country. So they, were, they eventually realized that they were fighting a losing battle, that the black South Africans and the black administrators and the black sportsmen and the black bodies were not their problem. Their problem was the white South African nationalist government. So for me, the realization that uh, that you were your own enemy uh, only dawned upon them uh, when South Africa's democracy had evolved. Cricket, I'm glad, played a big part in changing the thinking of everybody eventually to say, come on, you've isolated people for 50 years, thousands of great players or people never got the opportunities. So we are lucky today, our youngsters are fortunate, facilities-wise, opportunity-wise. Stay with us as after the break, we bring you more from the Transvaal Cricket Reunion at the One West Stadium and we also delve more into the history of cricket in South Africa. Welcome back to the Transvaal Cricket Reunion held at One West Stadium late last year and some untold stories of the history of cricket in South Africa. Gentlemen in attendance at the reunion played cricket from the 1940s up to the late 90s before the unification of South African cricket. During this period, it was difficult for non-white clubs and unions to finance their operations, and cricket was played purely for passion. A prominent and wealthy family at the time, the Dadabais, decided to get involved with the sport, and this led to the establishment of the Dadabai Cup, which was a national cricket tournament contested by non-white clubs. 
You see, we, we had a family, the Dadabai family. We didn't have the finances. The Dadabai family was quite influential, very rich. And they said, okay, we'll play, we'll, we'll sponsor the cup. And we played for that cup. And for us to play for that cup, that was the highest for us, the so-called non-white Zen, to reach, uh, like the curry cup they have, we had a Dadabai cup. And for us to win that cup meant a lot, meant a lot for us. Although Transvaal won the very first Dadabai Cup, the Western Cape cricket team dominated thereafter as they won it year after year. Transvaal eventually reclaimed the cup from Western Cape in a year they were captained by the formidable Abdul Bamji. Thus the reunion was to also commemorate that particular Dadabai Cup tournament win and also the indomitable captaincy of Abdul Bamji. What had happened in 1974-75 prior to those uh, that uh, uh, attempted unity uh, the Transvaal team actually won the prestigious Dadabai Cup tournament, uh, the trophy. So the whole reunion was obviously uh, 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 mainly to get together, but also just to pay tribute to Abu Abdul, who's turned 80. And I think in so doing, it was also a case of uh, acknowledging his fellow cricketers and also the cricketers that played in all of those eras, and most of them were present. And I think that's what made, uh, that's what sort of crowned that, that entire event. And it, were, it went off very successfully. All the men that played in the era of that Dadabai Cup were local heroes, and they passed down their passion for the game from generation to generation. These guys that are here today, Abdul Bamji, etc., they were household names. We remember them. We used to go out as little boys and imitate them. Um, you know, we, there was no TV those days. We couldn't watch international cricket. So these are our heroes. So that's why today it's a phenomenal feat to be here, to, to actually see them still alive because we remember them in their playing days. They taught us how to play the game. You know, I was also inspired because I had cricketers like Vincent Barnes, who I, I played with. And, uh, you know, what was remarkable about him was that uh, we, we, we competed with each other, we challenged each other, and we played together. And it was Faik Davids, the great Said Majid. So we had some great cricketers in our era. And prior to that, at the reunion, we had the likes of cricketers who were here, Tiffy Barnes, Abu Manak, Morris Garuda. And these were cricketers, Munir Saleh, who were all cricketers who I was just, I just caught the edge of them. And I was so blessed to get the experience from them because that was the starting point and they gave me the kickstart of you know, to believe in myself, to have the ability to, to go forward. Some of the veterans reveled in their fondest cricket memories. My fondest memories was, of course, uh, uh, the unity of black cricket. Uh, cricket is playing under difficult conditions, and we really enjoyed the weekends playing there under difficult conditions. That was there, and of course, the other fond uh, memories were also uh, Basil de Oliveira. He came through and spent a season or two with Eastern Province and playing against him and also alongside him was uh, one of the fondest memories. So those benefits that we had was also tremendous. Yeah, we, got, uh, we played for the South African Invitation 11 against Western Province and both times I got centuries and Basil also got. so. That was important, so, you know, you remember that. Or with uh, Abdul Bamji, I think it's still a record, the 149, first wicket, and with uh, Amadi Gabru, 279 against Natel. Yes. So things like that uh, stand out. For the cricketers of yesteryear, it was not only about passing down their considerable knowledge about the game to the next generation, it was about building sustainability within their communities for years to come. They made sure that the children coming through took care of the game off the field as much as they did on it. From a playing point of view, of course, as juniors, where we organize our own cricket, because schools wouldn't even have cricket organized. So we would go and uh, roll out the mats on those pitches on our own. We had to carry them, and they probably weighed about 200 kilos, but we'd put stumps under the coir matting, six or eight of us carrying it to the middle, rolling it out, putting the stumps down, picking teams, making sure we had on whites, and played our own organized cricket. Yeah, it was mat made of hessian, you know. It was what you had to, you had to carry it. What we used to do, it was to be rolled up in the little shed. You put three stumps and six of us carried it like a coffin to the center. The, the, the center of the pitch was like antique or clay. It was rolled hard. Then you ra rolled out the mat from the stumps to the stumps, you know, the creases were marked. You nailed it in 
and then you played on it, you stretched it. Then of course, as it got worn out, there were holes. You didn't have money to buy another mat. You don't know when you're going to get a benefactor or some donation. So half the time you were playing where you were batting, it got worn out more quickly. There were holes you could trip and so on. So it was a challenge, but uh, it was still enjoyable. We played for pride, for performance and for enjoyment. It was taking you away from a, you're a subdued race. So this was one outlet to let off steam, you know. Those are fond memories because some of those friends are still with me today and uh, they're all involved in the, in, in the game at different levels and uh, we involved in administration wherever we are. An exceptional example of administrative talent is none other than Mr. Gulam Raja, who served the South African national team as team manager for more than 20 years since the beginning of unification in 1991. We heard from him about what it took to accomplish such a milestone at the dawn of a new South Africa. I had this belief without trying to sound big-headed about it. I said to myself, Gulam, you got a passion for cricket, you got a passion for people. Now, if you combine the two, don't you think you could do a job? Eddie Barlow said to me, if you don't take it, I'll be very disappointed. So I said, Eddie, why? As he said, I watched you in England. You didn't realize that some of the senior players were watching you, but the way you ran the team is the way we want it to be run. So if you stay on, and if you want to add some value to South African cricket, here's your opportunity. I thought one year, fine, let me do it. One year, finished off 20 years later. At the beginning of the unification period, all cricket boards were combined to create the UCB or the United Cricket Board, which saw South Africa readmitted into world cricket as members of the ICC. But transformation within the team itself proved to be difficult as people of colour had a long uphill battle to develop players from a grassroots level that could be competitive as young adults. The efforts of development programmes resulted in more black players emerging from the system by the 2010s. Cricket South Africa thus created opportunities for black players when in 2016 they implemented a racial quota system for the national team, where they sought to have an average minimum of six black players, with at least two being black African, across all three formats of the game. When players were given the opportunity, there wasn't a chance where players were suddenly saying, you know, you're play and, and given up, so they had to create something like the quota system. And I think that worked brilliantly, because if it wasn't for the quota system, players like Makaya and Tini wouldn't have been gems like it wouldn't be found. Hashim Amla, um, Ashwal Prince, players like this wouldn't have been earthed um, in, 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 in the environment that we came from and the difficulties that came from it. And yes, I was definitely for the quota system because I believe that was a way of going us forward. You can only imagine what it would have been had we been a free country then already. And as a nation, where we would have been as far as sport is concerned around the world. Even though we come through as a new country now, just 25, 26 years into our democracy, the rugby fellows have won two World Cups. And uh, what we see now is, is, is the, uh, the inclusion of, of players of color who are holding their own, that make it on merit. Given the level our national team has reached in recent years, often being ranked as the number one team across various formats, we have to be grateful for those who fought to overthrow and dispose of the oppressive policies of the apartheid system, policies that prevented integration and unification of all citizens within something as beautiful as sport. One such hero who stands out amongst many is none other than Nelson Mandela, a man who understood that sport had the power to unite and could be used to spread a message of love and unity for one another in pursuit of national pride through victory. Such is the role that cricket, amongst many other sports, played in politics in South Africa. No, I think, I think his vision was uh, tremendous because looking at sport and to bring about the changes because normally without sport, to try and transform South Africa into democracy, especially after 1994, it wasn't possible. But through the medium of sport, that brought lots of people together as well. In the last, say, 30, 40 years after we've had unity and so on, and after Nelson Mandela's release and democracy, I honestly think no child in South Africa can say he was denied an opportunity to play at the highest level. If a little boy from a township in Kwamashu or Langa was showing promise with a cricket ball. 
there will be somewhere you can place him in a team and he can join an academy, get expert coaching and uh, people will notice him and he can play at underage level in the different groups and go up to provincial level and then start playing professional cricket and stand the same chance as all the others being to be selected for South Africa. I don't think you can say that opportunity is being denied now. That's where we're going. And you'll see it now if you look at the domestic cricket here, you know, cricket in this country, how many names. It was a privilege to have been part of the gathering of former players of the legendary Transvaal cricket team. It is often said that we cannot know where we are going unless we know where we come from. The rich history that was unearthed during this reunion certainly paints a clearer picture of where we are coming from. We need a lot of people to know that our cricket also had a history, a very rich history. But unfortunately, the political situation at the time did not allow it for this to happen. But now that everybody knows about this, we want people to know that we did have a very rich cricket history. Whether it was in the Transvaal, whether it was in the Cape, whether it was in Natal, we had an excellent cricket history, which I think tended to be forgotten. And this function here today was to get everybody together and to let them know we also played. Heartfelt smiles and warm embraces, great laughs, a feast shared, heroes celebrated, and maybe even some tears shared here and there, made the reunion unforgettable. When all was said and done, the cricket veterans were grateful for the chance to relive some of their glory days playing the gentleman's game. I say, thank God I'm still alive. Like say, you must be alive to smell the coffee or to smell the roses. And to me, it was such an important day. Not only that, to see chaps coming here with crutches, you know, friends that played with you, people you haven't seen for years, and to meet them today was such an honor for me. It was long awaited. I think it was needed because uh, there were cricketers from the late 60s into the 70s, up till now, so between 30 and 40 years, people haven't seen each other. So that brought uh, lots of fond memories. It was fantastic, really, to meet friends and cricketers after 30, 40 years. You thought, why didn't we have it regularly? Players who I looked up to, players who were my heroes, coming from Botswana, Chicken Bamji and, these, and the crew, it was unbelievable to reunite it with them because these were heroes that we looked up to and suddenly here yeah, they were all together. It was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful and I think we should have more experience that this was a wonderful experience. In fact, everyone who attended was at the happy faces and just to watch, uh, for me to sit back and watch all those cricketers of the old era uh, hugging and cuddling one another and talking about the good times and actually holding hands and, and unable to let go. Uh, and what was important was most of them didn't want to leave the place at the end of the day. So over, overall it was, it was a successful reunion and, and I'm glad for it because some of them who may not be with us too long will die happy men. It's gone fine. Will it go for four? Murnelli makes it 100.